Good afternoon, folks. Uh, it's Dave Burrows, uh, at Chief uh, Investment Strategist at Barometer Capital Management, and I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join in today. Uh, we are one week further along in the process going through this um, COVID health crisis, uh, and as you know, we've been very focused on our job, which is understanding uh, what the markets are telling us, trying to focus our portfolios in some productive assets, and and really assess where the risks lie. Uh, we've been talking about uh, sort of the current market environment and, and what we have seen leading. And a lot of the tools that we use are, are driven by, uh, by what the market's doing uh, to tell us uh, and give us clues as to what may be coming. Uh, today, I wanted to welcome Leland Miller on our call. Uh, we've known Leland for some time. He has a very, very interesting business called China Beige Book. I'm going to let Leland tell you a little bit about the business, but then partic in particular, uh, give us a sense for what his work is telling him. Uh, as the name might, uh, might uh, tell you, China Beige Book is a business that's focused on understanding what's going on in the ground, on the ground in China, uh, in business. Uh, Leland has an army of people. They're focused on collecting data and uh, arguably a lot more valuable than, than official Chinese government data. Leland is a consultant to many central banks. Uh, he is a consultant to us. And, and we use lots of different tools to try and glean what may be coming. And, and I think that Leland may have some good insights for us today. Before we get going, I just wanna quickly run through kind of our current views on things and where we've been just to, to frame things. And then maybe we can get Leland to, to add to the picture as we go along. As you know, very st straightforward process here. We're, we don't need to be everywhere. We're trying to identify where the leadership is. And that could be specific themes or sectors or asset classes and try and target the areas that where we have the wind at our back. Uh, we're always looking for new leadership that may emerge or where existing leadership may wane so that we can readjust our portfolios. And then of course, there are those times when nothing works and we have to have an ability to play defense or be out of big parts of the market. So it, it, it is a very tactical approach and we are always working at kind of trimming the sales. As you know, we think we've been in a structural bull market in stocks now since 2013. Uh, and certainly there are significant interruptions in structural bull markets along the way, uh, but that has been the backdrop. We also have had a view we're in the process of putting in a generational low in long-term interest rates, and that has significant implications for what may work going forward. Um, through the crisis, uh, market uh, basically came down to trend line, briefly dipped below it, and has maintained long-term trends since 2013, and the leadership in the market has been the NASDAQ and the big growth stocks. We, we went through that terrible waterfall decline, and at that point, we thought we might get a significant bounce, and then the market would have some work to do. Um, going through the decline, we worked really hard in the various pools and portfolios that we manage to manage that decline and maintain some flexibility. And then on the other side, try to take advantage of what's coming. So when we compared to like 87's crash, our comment was that there was a significant bounce and then the market had to do some work for a bit. Uh, but ultimately, a couple of years later, market was taking out the highs. And of course, we moved on and moved much higher in markets. We've pointed out that after m almost every waterfall type decline, there has been a significant period of retesting that goes on. That doesn't mean it has to happen, but it means it's a, it's a strong possibility. And given the fact that we have as much certainty as we look forward, it's possible there can be some glitches along the way in the reopening of the economy. Certain industries benefit, certain industries get hurt. And while the Fed has done a tremendous amount from an accommodative monetary policy standpoint, to maintain liquidity, it doesn't mean that there won't be any insolvency, so we gotta watch hard. We got a great bounce off the bottom, about 60% of what was given up in the S&P. We had an initial lift, a technical bounce, a little bit of a pullback. We had a second bounce based on uh, the stimulus and the improvement in the COVID cases. And then a couple of weeks ago, we said, we think we will chop sideways here for a bit and let the market do some sorting find out what was real buying and maybe what was challenged or what was short covering that might wane a little bit. Um, from our perspective, we spend our time looking at breadth and breadth bottomed out with only 6% of stocks in the, S in the NYSE performing well. 
We wound up with nine, close to 70% of stocks in uptrends. And since two weeks ago, the percent of stocks in uptrends has been deteriorating. That means the market's doing some sorting. Some really strong stocks have continued on and some have been a little weaker. In the S&P 500, we got to the point where 90% of stocks were participating. Of course, not everything should be going higher. And we saw that deteriorate. We're sitting today, as of this morning, at 68%. And as you know, markets had a weaker day today, so that market will move lower. So the market does the sorting for us. It helps to point out what remains strong and what gives back the gains. NASDAQ has been incredibly strong, and the breadth has been working its way higher, and at this point remains solid. From a leadership perspective, the large cap growth stocks have been carrying the day. Relative price performance versus the market, lead coming into the decline, has lead coming out. These are largely secular growth companies with a structural tailwind, industries changing in their favor, sectors like technology and within technology cloud, making relative highs as of yesterday, software making relative highs as of yesterday, internet commerce and infrastructure making relative highs. Some would say these are the new super utilities, companies that supply a baseline structure for a host of companies that are building their businesses on the internet. Biotech obviously has been leading the market. Solar and alternative energy, very, very strong. All of these are structurally helped themes by what's been happening over the last six weeks. It's probably in, in many cases accelerated the move in their favor. Also doing very well has been gold and that's for different reasons. Um, as you know, we thought we came out of a base recently, much like we came out of in 2000 when gold bottomed at $250 an ounce. That might have something to do with the fact that we've seen just such tremendous stimulus, both monetary and fiscal stimulus poured into the system. Money's being printed. People are looking for a place that is a hard asset. So then there's the have nots. And this is becoming clearer and clearer over the last two weeks. Groups that had a rally off the bottom, but that have failed. So this is the bank ETF KBE, uh, a significant failure over the last two weeks, making relative lows versus the market. Industrials making relative lows. Real estate investment trusts making relative lows versus the market. Utilities weakening versus the market. So this is a bifurcated market. And we've been focused in those stronger groups. And as you know, we have been avoiding and reducing any exposure we had in those structurally challenged groups. So we always say, what could the market be telling us? It could be telling us that this startup isn't going to be as easy as people think, and that those are the groups with the most risk. It may be that, um, that uh, the belief is that we're getting close to a generational low in rates and the defensive sectors that act like bonds have started to underperform, we'll see. But stepping away from our work for a moment, and we have our view, I thought maybe it'd be useful to hear from Leland. Leland has a different view. His view is on China. And given the fact that China went into the crisis well before we did, and arguably has been coming out of the crisis earlier than we are, I thought maybe Leland could tell us a little bit about uh, China Beige Book and the work that he does. And then I had a few questions maybe uh, he and I could talk about. So Leland, could you just give us a little bit of background on China Beige Book? Yeah, happy to. Um, you know, in a nutshell, we don't trust the government story for reasons I'm no doubt going to give into in a few minutes. And as a result, we decided the only way to get real data out of the Chinese economy is, to, is for us to do it ourselves. So we survey thousands of Chinese firms releasing the data eight times a year across the entire economy, every major sector. 34 different subsectors, every region of China's economy, uh, across state and private firms, across small, micro, medium and large firms, basically trying to get a bottoms up look at the entire economy uh, that, you know, we put together a look at, at what all the different Chinas are across China's economy and then put an aggregate picture to, to try to understand what's going on from a macro level. Uh, the interesting thing here, of course, is that China's statistics, as we all increasingly know at this point, uh, are a political narrative. They, they're in there to talk, uh, you know, the government talking points, to talk about the strength of the party and the stability of the party and the great leadership uh, and stewardship of the economy by the party. Uh, and so they offer differ from what we're saying. The, the, the 
you know, the government likes to talk a stable story and a strong story. And that's not always what happens, particularly now. So we, we, we are coming out with a, a quite divergent view of what's actually happening on the ground in China. And I, I'm looking forward to getting into it. So, so maybe Lynn, you could give us a little bit of a picture as to, I mean, certainly they have a political narrative in, in, in wanting to look as though uh, this is all going smoothly. I'm interested in your thoughts on, on what the experience has been so far in what you've seen going on, and I know the data is still limited, um, mm -hmm. but, but from, a, from a consumer perspective and maybe also from a manufacturing perspective, you know, how, how things look like they're progressing. Sure. So I think the best way to do this is to is to take a step back and look at Q1, because the first quarter were the worst data we've ever seen, and it's not even close. Um, not only we were just about every metric, every region, every sector, every key headline metric, not only were they at the worst levels we've ever seen, they were in all in severe contraction. And at the time, you know, the, there were forecasts about positive first quarter growth in China in February and early March. Uh, these eventually went away. China reported, you know, negative 6.8% uh, contraction uh, in, in the first quarter. We think it's uh, about double that, probably 11 or 12% contraction. Uh, but that story is not that surprising. You know, the, the government shut down the economy, shut down logistics, shut down travel. Uh, so the idea that you had a, 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 a bad first quarter uh, isn't shocking, at least anymore, to people. What's very important to identify, though, and this is for, for the China growth story, this is for the world recovery story, um, and, and the example it may or may not set for the rest of the world, you know, what's happening in the months after COVID has at least been partially contained. Uh, it's interesting because if you look at Chinese government headlines and Chinese government data, there was a lot of uh, stressing of reopenings. Talk about these, this many firm going back to work, look at traffic, look at, look at the number, the share of firms we're advertising that are, that are back. The workforces are back. The CEOs are back. So in uh, uh, March, you saw a lot of official trumpeting of the fact the economy was reopening quickly. Uh, but we were very careful to point out when we looked at the data ourselves is that back to work did not mean back to growth. It certainly didn't mean back to old levels of growth. And as we got into early March, despite the fact that they were very aggressively pushing workforces back and they were aggressively forcing businesses to get in the position to open, you were seeing the metrics actually contract further, not get better. Now, by the end of the first quarter, you know, you, you started to have a little bit of, a, of an upward trend. And in May, and in, sorry, excuse me, in April, um, we started to see better numbers, uh, but only better numbers as compared to what was happening in the depths of January and February. Uh, this is why the word recovery has lost almost all its meaning. You know, I get asked all the time, is China recovering? Well, sure. It shut down completely in February. It's recovering from that. But it is not recovering in any real sense. You're not seeing a return to old patterns of growth. You're not seeing anywhere near the trajectory needed for targeted levels of growth. I think the takeaway here, and we saw this very clearly in our April data, is that we were focusing on the private sector and small, medium-sized enterprises. Now, this is the real economy, not the large state firms, not the national champions you read about, not the large giants that are covered by the official PMI, but the private sector. And the, the official readings reflecting the bigger firms, the firms closer to Beijing and Shanghai and Guangdong uh, were doing better. They had pushed into, into positive growth. But the private sector firms, SMEs, which is the overwhelming, uh, overwhelming uh, portion of the economy, these firms were actually extremely challenged. They're still in contraction. They've got a very tough time. So it looks like that there is a divergence right now between some of the firms that have, you know, Beijing's arms around them um, and, and the rest of the economy, which is very, diff has some enormous challenges right now. Uh, we were still seeing, even in April, like this is, this is just a couple of days ago, sales volumes still contracting production still contracting, hiring and manufacturing still contracting, services bounce back up a little bit, but it's really a much more challenging environment than you understand simply by looking at, an, at a PMI number, which may be barely positive. That is not, that is, that, is, that is certainly understating the challenges China has right now in getting back up to speed. So, so when we look at things, our big concern right now is, yes, things are getting better, but there's this assumption that everything's just going to ramp right back up and by the end of the year we're flying again. We have a couple of questions and one of them is around the consumer. The consumer discretionary sector in general has been weak if you take away say Walmart and Amazon. Um, it may be that the manufacturers ramp up. The question is what kind of demand is there going to be? 
uh, for services and so on. And, and so maybe you could talk a little bit about w what your thoughts are on manufacturing on one side and then on the other side, are consumer patterns changed uh, or challenged in their ability to come back and consume? Right. Um, look, they're, they're both challenging stories, but they're a little bit different. So when you look back to manufacturing, the government wants a factory to start back up. It shoves its workers back, gets its CEO back, force it to turn, turn on the lights, and the factory is supposedly up and running. But the problem right now is you have extraordinarily weak domestic demand uh, that, that's improving now, coming, in, coming into May, uh, but still weak. And now you just had foreign orders fall off a cliff. So the, the, the challenging thing for China's economy is when this was original, when COVID-19 was originally a Chinese story, then the government said, look, we have to shut down the economy for as long as we need to do it. And then we're going to rush things back to work, everybody back to work, and we're going to get growth going again. And we're going to report a V-shaped recovery. And we'll either actually have a V-shaped recovery because of stimulus, or we'll just report one and no one will know any better. Uh, and, and look, you know, no one will be able to say any different because we control our own data. Uh, this changed dramatically when when COVID spread around the world. So when you have the European economy shut down, the Canadian economy and partially shut down, you have your European economies partially shut down. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a major blow. And now, no matter what the Chinese do domestically, uh, it's not about, the recovery story is not about domestic resiliency. It's about the uh, recovering global, global trade patterns, reco uh, recovering global demand. This is going to be absolutely fundamental to the recovery story. So from the manufacturing side, these guys are back to work. We showed over 90% of, 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 of companies now are back to work in our April data, which is great. But orders are falling off. These order books look ugly. Uh, the, the domestic orders are weak and the foreign orders just fell off an absolute cliff. So manufacturers could be back to work, but it doesn't mean that they're doing much. It doesn't mean that they're, 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 they're producing things or selling things in the way they need to be doing it. Um, the consumer story is still playing out right now. Uh, we have new data coming in, early data, for, flash data for the second quarter. We'll be in in about two weeks. We'll have the first sort of nuggets in, in terms of, of how Con uh, the consumption culture is is rebounding or not, but you know, anecdotally so far, what we've seen is is not terribly encouraging. Um, people are trying to get on with their life to the extent where they go to work and they commute home, but patterns have changed. People don't do the same. They don't go out to restaurants. With restaurants, they do go out have 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 distance social distancing requirements. Uh, they don't want to go to shopping malls. Uh, there are some revenge purchases. You know, we've seen in some in the auto data, people have held out for four months and purchasing. But this is not durable demand, and so I think everything we've seen so far leads us to believe that even in a more positive scenario, this is going to be a much longer, much harder recovery for the retail and services sectors, even if the government does everything right in terms of getting people back to work, at work and even if the outbreak is contained. Right. Uh, it, and if that's not the case, then you're going to see e even tougher, even, even tougher challenges ahead. It's, it's interesting. I, I've got on the screen the, the ETF for the Chinese web companies, the equivalent of the e-commerce companies in, in the U.S. And of course, they've done much better than the market, arguably probably consumer patterns changing you know, a little bit there. When, when we talk about the S&P, we forget sometimes we're not talking about the American economy because there are some world beating companies in there that do not represent, you know, Main Street USA. And, and so, that, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to see how those companies could be outperforming what people are feeling kind of on the street. The, the next thing I was wondering about is that, you know, we've been so focused on this COVID issue. And a year ago, all we talked about was trade. And so I, in some ways, wonder, we're, we're coming into this election cycle. Uh, the White House over the last two or three weeks has become more and more combative in pointing the finger at China as the source of the COVID virus, mm -hmm. talking about restitution and, and other things. Um, how do you feel about the, the, the longevity of this trade deal? Are there risks that that's going to come back into the forefront? Absolutely. Phase one, the U.S.-China phase one trade deal is, is on a respirator right now. Uh, and I would expect it to, uh, to not last the fall. Uh, and, and here's why. You know, before, going up until the COVID pandemic spread across the world, phase one was actually um, positioned pretty well 
to make it through the 2020 election. Trump liked it. It was, it was, he was delivering his agricultural purchases. He doesn't care about any of the structural reform that the deal didn't deliver. And the Chinese were, were happy enough to buy some things if it would get the, you know, the US off its back for a year. Everybody who's involved in this knew that this wasn't a two-year deal. This was two one-year deals. And the first year had a very good chance of happening. And the second year had almost no chance of happening. Uh, but, that, but politics would dictate both. And, 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 and we would see after the election whether we had a President Trump and what he wanted to do if he was still around. Uh, COVID's changed all this. And there has been such dramatic hostility around the world, but particularly in the United States, over uh, China's role in the COVID cover-up. And, and, and this has been uh, had the fan, fanning the flames for uh, domestically on this issue across Congress. And so what we're seeing right now is a, an absolutely toxic environment going into, in, into the fall. Um, it will be very difficult for President Trump to stick with this trade deal much longer. The Chinese are not delivering on their end. Part of it's because their economy was shut down. Part of it's because the trade, so most of the obligations were unrealistic to start with. They will be able to over deliver on a few, on a few targets in the agricultural realm. They could do soy or corn. So there are ways to keep this going a bit longer uh, by, by stressing the success stories and even how the Chinese are buying more than expected in certain ways. But it is such a toxic environment that I would expect this trade deal is not going to last all that much longer. And when that happens, then markets are going to freak out thinking we're, 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 we're you know, right. falling back into the abyss. And, and to some degree, that's right. The question is, is whether that abyss continues uh, much beyond the election, regardless who's elected. Right. So um, I'm going to ask you one more question. In the meantime, I know that for the, for the folks that are on the webcast, you can type a question in in the question and answer box, and, and we'll see if we can answer it uh, as we're finishing here. Um, Leland, I guess uh, the last question that I have is, um, as, as, as the reopening is coming along, the Fed has made it clear that they're willing to do more. And certainly the legislators are trying to negotiate additional support for the economy. I know that uh, Nancy Pelosi came forward with something yesterday, close to $3 trillion. We haven't heard that much about what's going on in China. Are they, are they as stimulative in China as we are seeing in the US? Because at the end of the day, you know, the, old, the old saying is don't fight the Fed and you have to give respect to the fact that you know, they are the ones that choose to print the money. Uh, they do have a lot of power. What about the Chinese? What are they doing? Well, I think that's an important point that not enough people are watching. You expect China to always be the stimulus king. And what you saw in the United States was immense. And then all of a sudden in China, you're just seeing, you know, some high but not not exorbitant credit numbers and 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 not much else. And, but you know, part of this was structural. So in you know in the in in the Q1 numbers we saw in March, and all, uh, we we saw uh, elevated but not shockingly high levels of borrowing. A lot of that though is because of physical disruptions to the credit credit environment. Uh, you know, you didn't have people who could access banks. The economy is still shut down. Our April data show that there's a much more of a surge uh, at banks right now. But um, e even so, uh, the big question is not so much, will the spigots open for domestic companies? Of course they will. You know, the manufacturers are up front, property developers in the back, but the spigots are opening. The real question, though, that everyone cares about is, will the Chinese go back to the old playbook of heavy infrastructure spending? And so far, it's been remarkable. They have, for years, they have not done so, despite down ticks in growth and despite troubles in the trade war. Um, you know, and in the run up to the Party Congress in 2017, uh, there was a there was an early 2016 panic in Chinese markets, and the recovery was overwhelmingly fueled by heavy building. And we saw these in our in our metrics, you know, just shot straight up. We saw the recovery and all the data. They just build, build, build. A lot of these were were ghost cities. A lot of these were bridges to nowhere. But they built and they and they and they forced themselves a recovery. But there were a lot of people very skeptical of that approach and said, "Look, we did that in 2008 or 2010, you know, 2008 to 2011. We did that in 2016, 2017. We can't do that anymore." And they have not done it. We've seen this in our data. They they have not done it. There's a very big conversation now whether they're going to need to go back to this. Because where I think that in a COVID-less world, they will resign to not dip back into this old playbook, uh, they have to see what's coming next from external demand. And if the U.S. economy, if the Canadian economy, if the European economies all are shut down longer than people think, if global demand doesn't return, if supply chains still feel as much pain and they don't get back up and running, which is something we're tracking very closely, um, 
they're going to have to they're going to have to do something extraordinary. So I think right now you've got a you've got a major political session in, in Beijing in, in in the next two weeks. Topic number one is can we get through this without heavy building and going back to the old playbook? I think the answer is no, uh, but we haven't yet seen our data. So I think that the as we go into June into July, there are going to be some historic level decisions made by the Beijing leadership. Uh, and, and, and we're looking forward to seeing these in our data because we'll, we'll catch them first. So, so um, I just have, a, there's a couple of questions that have come from the folks on the call. Um, one of the questions I thought was a, was a good one is, his question is given the unique position of the U.S. as the only global reserve currency, and given the Fed's unwillingness to follow the path of other central banks and neg negative rates, are we headed for round two of the currency wars? Now I note that the, that the yuan has traded up through seven and is, is sticking there. Uh, uh, are they going back to sort of some currency manipulation to make them more competitive? Uh, look, the, the, the Chinese currency is always manipulated. It just happens to have been manipulated over the last several years in a way advantageous to the United States. So if, if, if the PBOC would have stepped in over the last several years, considering all the China weakness, there would have been a significant depreciation of the currency. And the central bank has actually been stepping in to keep it stronger. Uh, mm -hmm. Because one of the misconceptions around the currency is that the Chinese are not in there to devalue the currency in order to make exports more competitive. That's, that's, that's the old playbook. Uh, what they're looking to do now is they want stability. And they want a soft peg of the dollar. They want to take advantage of the dollar stability. So a perfect uh, universe for them would be a uh, relatively a stable but not too strong dollar uh, mm -hmm. with a domestic currency that stayed stronger than the basket. Now, the basket of, of other currencies is mostly a rhetorical uh, trick that the Chinese use in order to not talk, in order to, to move against the dollar. Uh, but in any case, what they'd like to do is see a relatively strong Chinese currency against the rest of the world uh, and a stable one as it's pegged to the dollar and not worry about depreciation and, and devaluations and others because any boost they got from devaluing their currency would one be followed by all kinds of other devaluations everywhere else. No, no one else is standing pat. There'd also be a political reaction from Europe and from the United States and everywhere else that would be, that would be uh, quite, quite miraculous. But the real, the real situation, and this is something that, that we've spoken to folks in Beijing since 2016, they were scared to death by the fact that when they started to, to devalue the currency, they are not sure they can stop it at any particular level. Uh, there's a lot of analysis out there that says, oh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll move it down to 7.3 7, 7 and keep it there for a while. You know, it's not at all clear that they're going to be able to move it somewhere and the market's not going to take over and, 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 and flood the, the efforts of the PBOC. So it is not, I don't want to say that there's no situation in which we could see a major devaluation of the Chinese currency. And certainly if we saw a very strong dollar there would be pressure to blow off some steam against the dollar specifically. But the idea that the currency is, a, is in the toolkit to be able to manipulate in a big way, uh, I, don't, I don't see that as li likely at all. I think that it's a break the glass. If it's a break the glass emergency because we're, we're, we're at the onset of Armageddon, then all bets are off. But other than that, I think the Chinese want to keep it stable and they want to keep it relatively strong. Great. So, um, so just to, to kind of wrap up here, um, uh, we'll, we'll work at coming back and answering any other questions that were left. My takeaway from you, Leland, is that uh, the experience that they're having so far is somewhat uneven in the recovery. It's early to know. Um, it's probably having an easier time ramping up manufacturing than ramping up consumer demand. Um, I think that that leaves us with some questions around you know, consumer behavior here in North America as things reopen, how quickly will the demand return? Um, and I think my big question is if uh, services reopen but can only operate at 30 to 50 percent, just how much money do companies lose operating at such low uh, capacity utilization? And that's, and that's a big question. Um, Leland, I want to thank you very much for, for taking the time to, uh, to talk to us today. I want to thank everybody for, for being on our call. Uh, to all the clients of Barometer out there, thank you for being clients. Uh, and for those of you who aren't, we would love to have you as clients. Um, thanks very much. Thanks very much to all the investment counselors who helped put this uh, webcast together. Uh, we look forward to doing another one next week. And uh, I think we have a very interesting topic, which we'll, we'll go through uh, 
uh, in the invitation. But thanks very much for everybody for tuning in.